Yeah, he must be up here. And then you just walk over. Yeah. And Michelle's going to introduce you, John. I'll introduce you, Bud. Okay, we're going to get started. Uh, it's 2 o'clock, so we will get on the road. So welcome to the year in review. My name is David Buick from St. John, New Brunswick. And I'm the chair of this session. And my co-moderator is Dr. Michelle Graham to my left. Uh, these are learning tracks for those who haven't been here. There's three learning tracks, one hour each. Each We have two speakers, 20 minutes apiece, and then we have a Q&A for 20 minutes. So please use your ARS system, the audience response system, and send, your, or send or fire the questions in, and we'll try and get to them in that 20 minutes. If you wish, you can stand up and use the speak, uh, microphone. So I'm going to now introduce well, Michelle, D Dr. Graham, come up. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Buick. So I have the pleasure of introducing our first speaker, who is Dr. John Mancini, um, who uh, really is inc an incredibly impressive man, and I'm going to distill this into a very short introduction um, for sake of time. But Dr. Mancini uh, received his MD from the University of Toronto and subsequently did uh, internal medicine training there, and then was a cardiology and research fellow at the University of uh, California at San Diego. He eventually came back to Canada and was chair of medicine at UBC from 1992 to 2002. And he remains in Vancouver at UBC um, and directs an image-based research program, which is incredibly impressive. Um, and also remains an active clinical practice at the Vancouver, General, uh, Vancouver Hospital Cardiology Outpatient Clinic and directs the, relevant to today, he, he directs the Cardio Risk Clinic there, um, which provides comprehensive primary and secondary prevention therapy. And uh, he also works in the St. Paul's Hospital uh, Healthy Heart Prevention Program Lipid Clinic. And one of his major clinical focuses is to foster innovation in novel cardiovascular risk detection and therapy. And we welcome Dr. John Mancini. Thank you very much, Michelle. Very kind words. Um, and uh, there's some colleagues uh, uh, in the audience that represent uh, Save BC, another uh, a very important collaboration uh, for me in this area. So uh, I've uh, uh, changed the title to Controversies in CV Risk Management, How I Live With Them, so don't hold it against me because uh, you'll be hearing some uh, personal opinions here. These are my uh, uh, disclosures. And uh, David gave me a ton of homework, and it's shown here. There are actually seven subjects here, each of which would be a grand rounds. Uh, so I'm going to dive in right away, starting with aspirin in uh, primary prevention. What you see here in the uh, middle is the uh, spate of meta-analyses. There are uh, eight of them. Uh, that include the uh, newest uh, ASA trials in primary prevention, ARRIVE, ESPRIT, and ASCEND. On the right-hand side is the classical medical analysis from a decade ago. You can see in the green line that everyone agrees that MACE is reduced by uh, aspirin. However, the magnitude of benefit in uh, 2009 uh, was about 18%, whereas uh, more uh, currently, it's much smaller, uh, 10 to 12%. Everyone agrees in the next line uh, that's kind of pinkish that there's no cardiovascular mortality. And if you look down at the yellow, uh, everyone agrees that the point estimate for bleeding is well above one, but not everyone agrees that it's significant. So the principle of practice is to find people at high cardiovascular risk and low bleeding risk and this principle of practice has recently been uh, put to the test in uh, New Zealand, where they modeled several different models of risk and benefit, so this benefit-harm analysis. And I'm showing only one of them, where um, the uh, prevention of one cardiovascular event is negated by uh, the occurrence of one major bleed. And the categories are to model those that might get substantial benefit, some benefit, or a wash in terms of cardiovascular prevention, but equipoise uh, in case there are other benefits, such as uh, a lower cancer risk. If you look at the modeling in men, 
uh, substantial benefit occurs rarely, 2%. Add another 10% for some benefit, and if you consider equipoise, it's still less than 50% in men, and even worse in women. Identifying uh, high-risk patients is fairly traditional, using traditional calculators and risk factors. But the uh, interesting thing here is that when you're trying to predict the bleeding risk, you see these five factors here that popped out in the analysis. And in terms of uh, their commonness, they're very uncommon in the population overall. And if you look at this column, they're even uncommon in those patients who bleed and have a, a net hazard with aspirin treatment uh, uh, in this modeling. And so the net result of that is that it's easy to assess uh, cardiovascular risk, but predictors of bleeding will not often be present. So in practice, what this really amounts to is to considering a trial of aspirin if the patient wishes. Most patients asking about aspirin, based on the new data, have actually been on it for a long time. And if they've been on it without any bleeding issues, they actually may be uh, reaping some benefit without harm. So I don't discourage them from stopping it if they want to continue. But for the most part, for cardiovascular prevention in primary prevention, it should be the exception and not the rule. Coenzyme Q10 is obviously associated with goal inhibiting statin intolerance. This is a very poorly uh, studied uh, group of patients. Here is a summary of 12 trials representing a whopping 575 patients. There's absolutely no biomarker objective evidence of any effect of this. And the very subtle differences in pain uh, scores weakness scores and no changes in cramps or uh, uh, tiredness, even these effects uh, are highly dependent on the statistical premises that are chosen. So in my view, the weight of evidence is very poor and uh, there's no overwhelming evidence to suggest that the effects of other are other than placebo. Vitamin D, this has been a part of my career. Uh, uh, there, uh, since 1989, the first study shown here, 2018 is the last big one, the vital study. So there's 21 trials represented on this slide, 83,000 patients, and the fine print uh, sums up to the message that it's neutral for MACE, cause mortality, CV death, MI, and CVA. Omega-3 is uh, another very popular uh, intervention. This is a little more, a bit more tricky. We know that the typical omega-3 supplements that uh, we use off the shelf are combinations and not highly purified. The trials uh, that are summarized here, and there are 10 trials representing almost 80,000 patients, show complete neutrality as well for cardiovascular risk reduction. But these agents do lower triglyceride uh, as long as you keep an eye out for the uh, LDL. So this is a perfect segue into the triglyceride subject that uh, David assigned to me, which has been given new life with the uh, reducid trial. This is a very important trial and it's worth spending a bit of time on it. It's a large trial, over 8,000 patients in patients with ASCVD or high-risk diabetes. It was about five years of follow-up and it's important to recognize that although it's a population with hypertriglyceridemia, as shown here, that the LDL was pretty well treated. Um, the other thing that's important is that the intervention here is two grams BID, which is a high dose, of highly purified eicosapentaenoic acid. So it's not a combination omega-3, it's pure eicosapentaenoic uh, uh, versus placebo, which is mineral oil in this case. And what you can see very clearly is that all the endpoints are significantly reduced, and the only one that wasn't is down here, which is total mortality. There was a slight signal for minor bleeding and for atrial fibrillation uh, or flutter. However, this was offset, if you look here, with a 28% reduction in overall stroke. So this is a very important and interesting finding. Asking the question that David asked, is a triglyceride? Well, it's important that you recognize a triglyceride-rich VLDL and uh, their remnant particles and LDL particles, they all have one ApoB uh, as uh, 
they come out of the uh, liver. So the effect of lowering triglyceride on the risk of cardiovascular events can be directly compared to that of lowering LDL by comparing their effects on the basis of per unit change in ApoB. And Brian Ferentz has done this Mendelian randomization study, which showing here is the net effect of triglyceride lowering lifelong through uh, uh, inheritance of uh, SNPs as compared to the benefit of LDL lowering lifelong. You see that they are comparable when they are uh, uh, expressed per 10 milligrams per deciliter lowering of ApoB. So the issue is, is it really triglyceride or is this a surrogate marker for ApoB containing atherogenic particles? The relevance of this bit of biology to the REDUCA trial is that when you look at the results, it did not matter if the patients had high or low triglyceride at the beginning, and it did not matter if they achieved uh, a low triglyceride or not during the trial. The red is the uh, placebo group, uh, and the blue and green are those that are treated, irrespective of whether they achieved a high or low triglyceride. So, it's hard to uh, ascribe the uh, profound benefits on the basis of this uh, change in triglyceride or even in ApoB. And this has focused the discussion on other potential mechanisms of action, and in fact, they are many. And we know that there are endothelial, plaque, and anti-inflammatory properties of EPA, which are listed on this slide, and are legion. And I think this is a very exciting area that we're going to learn more about uh, uh, in terms of the mechanism of uh, benefit. We will learn more uh, very soon. There are large trials that will tell us if uh, the magic is EPA or if combinations are appropriate, as seen in these two trials, and if high doses versus lower doses are really a key to the success. So this is an evolving uh, area. PCSK9 inhibitors. These have been an unquestionable success story over the last number of years. And uh, I would say uh, success in two very fundamental ways. Number one, uh, these agents, the molecules themselves, are extremely safe. And on the left-hand side, you can see that all of these uh, safety issues, many of them uh, hangovers from the statin era, are all non-significant. The other very important lesson from this, because these are the newcomers on the block, they've been tested against uh, statin treatment. And so we have learned that these agents, not only are they safe in and of themselves, but ultra-low LDL is also safe. This is a fantastic new learning, uh, and it's a whole new field. The efficacy here boils down to about a 20% reduction in MI, ischemic stroke, and coronary revascularization. And there's been a lot of debate about uh, all-cause mortality trending downward, but not quite statistically significant. But I feel that that conversation is moot because these uh, studies are just so short that maybe we should have another conversation about all-cause mortality in another 2.3 years. However, all this beautiful science has been eclipsed in 2019 by the issue of access. And this is typified by uh, this uh, single slide, which represents one of many analyses, this one from the United States, showing that those patients who are eligible for PCSK9 but who are rejected uh, by uh, insurance companies actually incur a high degree of MACE, significant augmentation of MACE. That's not a surprise. The randomized clinical trials are not giving us a wrong answer. The other uh, uh, group is those who got it but then abandoned it because of co-payments or just the overall expense. They pay for that decision also with a significantly higher risk of MACE. The risk is also identified in this trial in a, in, in a very profound way. You can see here that patients positive for FH and ASCVD incur five times the hazard ratio for MACE. Positive for FH but not ASCVD, up to three times. ASCVD without FH, two and a half times. So these are the very high risk groups that we really need to get access uh, for these patients. 
Um, but um, it's still a, a problem, as you well know. Not just the money, but the paperwork to uh, overcome it. This is an interesting analysis from Stephen Grover's group showing that the, the probability of cost effectiveness of use of these agents uh, of 50% is achieved at a willingness to pay of about $100,000 per year of life saved if the drug were about $200 a month. A more traditional analysis at 50,000 per year of life saved is about $100 per month. So we're far away from that, and therefore we're far away from reaping the full true benefit of this uh, remarkable advance in lipid management. So hopefully uh, over time things will change. The final uh, area is that of coronary artery calcium scoring, or CACS. This is probably the most uh, uh, difficult one to uh, review. This has been on the table for quite a while. As typified here in this three-step algorithm, the first step is to follow your guideline to stratify patients into low, intermediate, and high risk. The second step is where uh, it becomes controversial. The notion is that all of the intermediate patients would be re-stratified based on calcium scoring, and a chunk of the low-risk patients with uh, worrisome features, in this case family history of premature AS uh, CVD, to which I would add a few other people, um, are added, and they all are intended to have a calcium score to see if it's zero or elevated. Elevated scores would warrant a discussion or uh, pushing for therapy. Uh, a calcium score of zero would uh, require simply lifestyle management with a so-called warranty of four to six years when you would reassess. This is money uh, that's required. Uh, it's part of uh, public policy in Texas where if you meet the criteria of intermediate risk and certain uh, age, uh, there's $200 in the bank waiting for you to get that scan. The cost effectiveness of this approach has been analyzed multiple times. This is one paper that summarizes six uh, analyses in the US, and the conclusions are quite diverse, uh, including that it's not cost effective versus just giving everyone a statin, that it might be cost effective in men but not in women, that it's cost effective if statins are expensive, which they're not, or if they have high disutility, which generally that is not the case. Uh, some patients, uh, however, assign a huge disutility to this, or uh, some physicians do as well. The most recent analysis suggests that it's a comparable way to uh, stratify lipid management if you're willing to pay for it. And so it's 50,000 per quality adjusted life year above and beyond the guidelines. This has led to uh, quite an emphasis in the American and the European guidelines where on the basis of theoretical rates using your favorite calculator, these folks in the middle are viewed as being candidates for this restratification with withholding of statin if the calcium score is zero and considering or recommending statin if it's above zero. Phil Greenland, who uh, published this, is a very level-headed uh, individual from the US. And in the very same paper, which I encourage you to read, this uh, figure uh, from the uh, heinz nixdorf recall study is worth looking at more carefully. What you see here is coronary event rates on the y-axis, and in the lower panel, cardiovascular event rates. The bars in blue are patients by European or American guidelines who would not warrant uh, a statin therapy, and the bars in red are those that would warrant it. And you can see this very nice uh, progressive increase in the bars as the calcium score gets uh, higher on the x-axis. But what you also must notice is that a zero calcium score is not associated with a zero event rate. And if I uh, resummarize this based on the actual cardiovascular event rates coming from the bottom panel here, what you see here is if you follow your guidelines, you end up with a group of patients with an actual event risk of 6 to 23% over 10 years. This to me is good general policy to be offering preventive therapy and one that I have no regrets in uh, supporting. It's a range of risk that is not dissimilar from uh, a range of risk defined solely by a calcium score above zero. 
The problem is when the guideline says the patient is fine, statin is not indicated. Here, the actual event rate is 1 to 18%. That's just not good enough for me. And this is where there's potentially a lot of regrets in uh, offering therapy, particularly in this group here, which will get you on the front page of the newspaper in not a good way. Uh, and so the uprisking, if you will, of coronary artery calcium scoring is uh, what I emphasize in my practice. So I believe that when a statin is indicated by guidelines that we as a profession should actually advocate for that statin. When a statin is not clearly indicated, then you can use other things such as calcium score to make sure that you're not missing a higher risk than you might otherwise calculate. The other which is very common is when the patient conveys a high disutility. A doc, I ache all over, or I'm getting split ends from my statins, uh, or when they are uh, statin reluctant uh, for other reasons. This is where other objective evidence and coronary calcium scoring is a, is a very compelling one, might inform the conversation and facilitate shared decision making in a more rational way. I do not believe, however, that we as a profession should be promoting the notion of high statin disutility because it's just not correct. And um, uh, so uh, I think that that is a concept that I'd like to leave with you. So seven takeaways, uh, David, uh, extensive homework. Uh, so aspirin in primary prevention, generally no for reducing cardiovascular disease. Coenzyme Q10, I don't use it myself, but I don't argue about it with the patients. Vitamin D does not appear to have a cardiovascular risk reduction benefit. Omega-3 supplements off the shelf may lower triglyceride, but do not lower cardiovascular events, and watch out for preparations that might increase LDL. Whether triglyceride is causal or a surrogate for biomarkers of ApoB, atherogenic particles is unclear to me. And understanding the mechanism of benefit of these highly purified versions of uh, EPA is still evolving. As far as PCSK9's uh, inhibitors are uh, a concern, a fantastic advance, but money talks, and so use is very limited to the highest risk patients, FH and or ASCVD, of course, only after statin and acetamide. And to reiterate with uh, calcium scoring, multiple RCTs show benefits of statins in large populations not screened with uh, calcium scoring. So my suggestion is to use it selectively. As a profession, we should focus on physician-driven uprisking in terms of patient counseling when there's pushback, patient-driven de-risking uh, is reasonable. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, it's my pleasure now to introduce uh, Dr. Subodh Verma, uh, friend and colleague. He's an internationally renowned cardiac surgeon and a scientist. He's professor at the University of Toronto. He has the uh, Canadian Research Chair in Cardiovascular Surgery. He's published in numerous very prestigious journals, including the New England Journal of Medicine, Circulation, Jack, Nature, and I could go on. Right? But importantly, he's actually taken a leadership role on seven ongoing global heart failure trials in diabetes. So if anyone can talk, which is a bit odd, a cardiac surgeon talking to diabetes, you might think, uh, it's, but Dr. Verma certainly has the background. Great, thank you, David, much appreciated. Uh, so uh, uh, thank you very much to both of our chairs for this very kind invitation. I'm, I'm truly honored to be here. Uh, my first paper, actually, when I was in Vancouver many, many years ago and I got started was, in fact, the effects of metformin on uh, diabetic cardiomyopathy, and since then, which is, I think, close to three decades ago, I've been interested in diabetes for a long time. Uh, these are my disclosures as shown here. I want to start by just reminding us all that no matter where you live in the, ro in the world, uh, the outcomes in patients with diabetes continue to be a recalcitrant problem. In Sweden, for example, the rate of decline in all-cause mortality has not followed the same trajectory in people with diabetes as you see in red compared to people without diabetes from 1998 to 2014. In fact, data from the CDC just published a few weeks ago in JAMA talks about the resurgence of cardiorenal complications in diabetes, complications such as myocardial infarction, renal disease, 
lower extremity amputations and end-stage renal disease, after many years of progress, seem to actually now be on the upswing, mostly in young and middle-aged individuals. So when David actually asked me to speak upon this topic specifically, pump pipes and filter, uh, that came from an editorial we wrote a few years ago uh, in response to some of the cardiovascular outcome trials trying to put into context these three important outcomes in people with diabetes. The fact that heart failure prevention and treatment is important in people with diabetes. Of course, MACE reduction is central and renal protection is also important. It's a nice way of thinking about and individualizing therapies that work across these three pillars in people with type 2 diabetes. Now we've had a absolute, uh, you know, uh, as, as John says, an embarrassment of riches with respect to the cardiovascular outcome trials. And I don't expect any one of you here to be able to synthesize and integrate all of this information in 20 minutes. The bottom line is that we have a lot of choices and we need to now think about you know, classes and specific patient types where we apply these strategies. So I'm going to start with the GLP-1 RA class and remind you that there are several trials, seven trials that have been completed. This is a busy slide. I just want you to focus on the uh, encircled part here that reminds us all that in these trials with GLP-1 RAs, various patient subgroups were evaluated, people with ASCVD or people with multiple risk factors. And if you look, for example, at trials like ELIXA, 100% of patients had, you know, established cardiovascular disease or ASCVD. And then the latest trial that Dr. Gerstein led from Hamilton, the Rewind trial, had 31% of patients with ASCVD and 60% that actually did not have ASCVD. Collectively, what have we learned about GLP-1 RAs? So Professor McMurray published this uh, meta-analyses of the seven completed GLP-1 RA trials in the Lancet Diabetes, again, about a month ago, and this provides us with context about how these agents work and for what outcomes do they work. So uh, there is some heterogeneity between the various agents, but collectively for the outcome of major adverse cardiovascular events, there appears to be a 12% relative risk reduction with GLP-1 RAs. For the outcome of cardiovascular death, likewise, there is a 12% statistically significant reduction in CV death. For the outcome of fatal or non-fatal myocardial infarction, a 9% relative risk reduction. And for the outcome of fatal or non-fatal stroke, you see a 16% relative risk reduction with GLP-1 RAs. How do these agents work? Uh, there have been you know, many proposed mechanisms uh, that have been put forward. Uh, there are, of course, the direct anti-atherosclerotic effects that are listed here, effects on endothelial function, smooth muscle cell proliferation, inflammation, and lipid accumulation. These effects appear to be independent of A1C reduction per se. And of course, these agents also have indirect effects to lower blood pressure, weight, and A1C, which all can also affect the atherothrombotic outcomes. I would like to uh, mention to you that there's a very important trial that's ongoing uh, called the SELECT trial. Uh, and this is a trial of a GLP-1 RA semaglutide in people without diabetes who've had a prior ischemic event, prior MI stroke or symptomatic PAD, uh, are receiving a GLP-1 RA who are moderately overweight uh, with the hypotheses that these agents will exhibit anti-atherosclerotic benefits even in the absence of diabetes. Now, what about the other class of agents? Uh, you know, when we wrote this editorial a few months ago, the results of DAPA-HF were not known. Now when we look back, I don't think we could have titled this any better. It has truly been a serendipitous story of a class of agents that started 
uh, as you know, glucose lowering, where the hope was just to show that they're safe. And from there, we have evolved into a class of agents that is not only good for the heart in terms of prevention of heart failure, the treatment of heart failure, the prevention and treatment of renal disease, and now expanding outside of diabetes. So the cardiovascular outcome trials that have been completed are three uh, specifically. EMPA-REG outcome actually enrolled all uh, ASCBD patients. The CANVAS program had a mix of patients with and without ASCBD and DECLARE uh, recruited the highest number of individuals with diabetes who had multiple risk factors and therefore we have the ability to look at this class of agents across the spectrum of people with and without ASCVD. The picture looks very similar for all three of them such that when you look at the red and the blue bars respectively this has really emerged as the signature of this class of agents profound and precocious reductions in heart failure and renal disease. There's something wrong with the formatting of this slide, but the red here is heart failure hospitalizations and CV death, and the blue are hard renal outcomes defined as end-stage renal disease, doubling of serum creatinine, renal death, or sustained reductions in GFR. That was also accompanied in the EMPA-REG outcome trial with a 38% reduction in cardiovascular death with the curves separating almost instantaneously. When you look at the CANVAS program in a broader population of patients, we found that in fact heart failure and renal disease outcomes were also similarly reduced quite profoundly in a broad population, something that was confirmed in even a less risk population in the DECLARE study, where the predominant population were people with diabetes and multiple risk factors, suggesting that the bandwidth of SGLT2 inhibitors is quite broad in that it extends from people with diabetes and multiple risk factors to people with diabetes who have established disease down to GFRs of 30. The recently completed Credence trial has added yet another layer of enthusiasm for this class of agents demonstrating in an albuminuric CKD population of people with diabetes that heart failure, hard renal outcomes are reduced substantially with SGLT2 inhibitors. So if you synthesize the information prior to DAPA-HF, which I will present in a minute, uh, what we have thought about SGLT2 inhibitors, do they cover pipe, pump, and filter outcomes? Certainly in people with diabetes who have established cardiovascular disease, there's a modest effect on ischemic outcomes such as MACE. But irrespective of whether people have diabetes with or without ASCVD, there is a consistent benefit to prevent heart failure. Remember, these trials enrolled a minority of patients with prevalent heart failure, and therefore, they gave us more information about the prevention of incident heart failure as opposed to the treatment of prevalent heart failure. And the renal, hard renal benefit also appeared to be seen irrespective of the risk level of a patient with diabetes. So we started this story, if I may, with mostly prevention. The next step was whether you could treat established heart failure and whether you could treat prevalent heart failure as, to, as opposed to preventing incident heart failure. And there were several signals in post hoc analyses that suggested that the benefit had nothing to do with A1C reduction lending uh, to this hypothesis that maybe these benefits can be seen even in people without diabetes. And it was that uh, thesis or hypothesis that was tested or and is being tested in many trials. But the first trial that we've reported called DAPA-HF at the ESC meeting uh, suggests that in close, close to 5,000 patients, 
who have heart failure with reduced ejection fraction treated with standard anti-failure therapy, including 71% of patients on an MRA with ejection fractions of 31% and elevated NT pro BNP, the addition of dapagliflozin was associated with a statistically significant 26% reduction in the composite of CV death or worsening heart failure. That translated into an NNT of 21, and individual components, including cardiovascular death, were reduced by 18%, and all-cause mortality was also reduced by 17%. What was even more intriguing was that half of the population did not have diabetes because diabetes was neither an inclusion nor an exclusion criteria. And what you find here is that there was absolutely no heterogeneity based on whether people had diabetes or not. And therefore, to the drugs that reduce mortality in HEFREF that all of you are quite familiar with, at this point in time, we add dapagliflozin to that list. Of course, other agents are being tested and will be added as they demonstrate efficacy. The ongoing trials, they're ambulatory trials. DAPA-HF has reported Emperor Reduced is a similar trial with some differences in terms of inclusion criteria with empagliflozin and HEFREF patients. Hopefully, uh, we will report it at the ESC meeting next year Emperor Preserved is ongoing in a HEF-PEF population. Deliver is ongoing also with dapagliflozin in a HEF-PEF population. The trials that are ambulatory include people with or without diabetes. On your right is the soloist worsening heart failure trial. This is a acute heart failure trial that includes people with or without HEF-PEF or HEF-REF who've been recently hospitalized for heart failure and that is at the present time limited to people with type 2 diabetes, but that may change if there are any soloist investigators in the room, that actually will be changing soon. Now, we don't know how these agents work, so don't try to read all of these things, but there's lots of hypotheses and theses on the table from super diuretics to, you know, magic drugs that actually change substrate utilization to erythropoietin increases, et cetera. Uh, so we're learning a lot about the biology. Uh, we have just completed one of the first randomized trials with Kim Connolly, uh, Andrew Yan, and other colleagues, Larry Leader and Bernie Zinman, uh, looking at cardiac MRI uh, in the context of a six-month trial of people with diabetes, just recently published in circulation demonstrating that these agents do facilitate cardiac reverse remodeling as assessed by LV mass index by MRI. So in the last few minutes that I have left, how do we integrate these two agents into decision making? And many individuals are trying, uh, and many organizations have put forward their proposals. The American College of Cardiology decision pathway is listed here which says the following, that if you have a patient with diabetes and established cardiovascular disease, you, as a cardiologist, not your colleague endocrinologist or family doc, should try to address those concurrently. And if you walk down the right panel, it ends up with two red boxes. Uh, you should think about initiating an SGLT2 inhibitor or a GLP-1-RA. The American Diabetes Association and the European Diabetes Association has said the following on your left. If you have a patient with diabetes who has ASCVD, consider a GLP-1-RA with proven CV benefit or an SGLT2 inhibitor. And if you have a patient with uh, diabetes on your right where heart failure or CKD is the predominant picture, then an SGLT2 and a GLP-1 as an alternative should be considered. Very recently, the European Society of Cardiology in Paris uh, a few months ago put forward these very, uh, some have called provocative cardiologists in general that I've spoken to have welcomed this guidance that have said the following, that in people who are type 2 diabetes and drug naive as shown on your left, who have ASCVD or 
multiple risk factors. That in green, you can see a SGLT2 inhibitor is, or a GLP-1 is preferred as initial therapy ahead of metformin. The first guidance in the world to suggest that these agents should be considered ahead of metformin uh, in cardiovascular risk reduction. Diabetes Canada has also followed the pump, pipe, and filter type of analogy, saying that in people with cardiovascular disease whose GFR is above 30, agents that reduce MACE events, agents that reduce heart failure, and agents that pro provide renal benefit need to be prioritized, and these include SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 RAs. Please remember that whereas DAPA, gliflozin, and semaglutide both have data for cardiovascular protection, they have not yet been incorporated in the guidelines since they have not yet been updated. At this meeting a few days ago, Jonathan Howlett uh, and Eileen O'Meara and others uh, have worked tirelessly, I would say, over the last several months to try to get this guidance ready uh, in time for the CCS. And uh, it's a really outstanding uh, draft or uh, recommendations that have been put forward. So what is updated is the following, that we recommend EMPA-CANADAPA SGLT2 inhibitors for the treatment of patients with type 2 diabetes who have concomitant ASCVD to reduce the risk of heart failure, hospitalizations, and death. And the second recommendation, which is a new recommendation, we recommend SGLT2 inhibitors such as DAPA be used in patients to prevent heart failure in keeping with the DECLARE study. In keeping with the CREDENCE study, a new recommendation for cardiorenal and heart failure protection in people with diabetes. And what, you know, again, hats off to, to Jonathan and Eileen for, again, their leadership here, the first guideline in the world to incorporate DAPA-HF, uh, both in people uh, with diabetes and people without diabetes. The conditional recommendation here is based on the fact that this is an off-label indication, and therefore we suggest that you don't use it offline until regulators have had a chance to actually put their teeth into it. Let me try to conclude by saying that at the ESC 2019 guidelines, there were 10 commandments that were listed uh, with respect to diabetes and CVD protection. And uh, I would like to remind you all that the ninth commandment was that SGLT2 and GLP-1 RAs are recommended as first-line therapy in people with diabetes. And uh, the Tenth Commandment for cardiologists was think diabetes. So I think an important message for all of us. I know I have 44 seconds left, but I was also asked to delve into this controversy which is extremely heated. I have only two slides here, and that is cabbage versus PCI. Oh my God, this would be uh, a debate that would actually last a long time. But I think the best quality of evidence we have thus far is the individual pooled analyses of patient data published by Stuart Head in The Lancet uh, in 2018. They've made some comments on the cover of The Lancet essentially suggesting that cabbage in multivessel disease wins, particularly in the context of diabetes with respect to all-cause mortality. The ESC guidelines have said the following, that generally with more complex disease presentation, it is recommended to revascularize with cabbage versus PCI in diabetes. And that in fact, if uh, the complexity is not as severe, then both cabbage and PCI have 1A recommendations. And this is, you know, again, a very complicated, heated topic that requires maybe a individual two to three hour session uh, on, its, on its own. So I would end by trying to incorporate what John said earlier to say that when we think about our foundational pillars of CV protection in type 2 diabetes, you've heard about lipids, you've heard about blood pressure, antiplatelet strategies have some asterisks on them because they, uh, you know, again, we have to balance risk and benefit. But I invite you all 
uh, that, uh, you know, to join many of us who think that this is really a tremendous privilege that we have these new therapies that are so profoundly efficacious and should really be integrated horizontally as foundational pillars of pharmacotherapy and vascular protection in people with diabetes. Thanks very much. <clears throat> okay, well, thanks, Subod, for a really nice overview. Uh, so send your questions in. We have them on the computer here. John, there's a few questions on uh, CT angiography and calcium being picked up. So if you did a MIBI scan, you pick up calcium on the aorta or the, some calcium on the LED. Can we use this as a surrogate marker for a high-risk individual, even if they have a, a negative functional study for ischemia? So the role of calcium being picked up indirectly on a chest X-ray or a flat plate looking at the aorta. Your comments? Well, um, it's a bit old school, but uh, we can still order a nuclear scan with an option for a calcium score, if appropriate. Uh, when you're trying to assess functional capacity, get an ejection fraction, and also uh, uh, understand whether there is uh, early underlying atherosclerosis based on calcium. There's a big difference, however, when you mention CT angiography. That's a different test. Uh, requires uh, appropriate renal function, uh, injection of contrast, and then you see the coronary arteries. And the goal here is, if you're really concerned about early atherosclerosis, you will see non-calcified plaque. It's, the yield is anywhere from 3 to 10 percent, depending on the uh, over and above calcium. Um, but it's not generally recommended uh, for screening other than in evaluation of chest pain. It's just to follow that line of thinking, so CT angiography certainly is more, well, it's generally available to most communities one way or the other. You may have to refer them to a larger center, but you can usually get a CT angiogram. How do you fit it into your uh, armamentarium of investigating chest pain? So you have a high-risk individual, a negative functional study. How often do you do an anatomical study to further risk stratify them? How do you personally put that into your... Yeah, so um, I would start the conversation by saying that uh, David's asking about something we haven't talked at all about today, and that's chest pain. Uh, that is not the discussion that I had earlier. Nope. That was asymptomatic risk stratification. But if chest pain is on the table, then uh, there's lots of evidence emerging that perhaps the first test uh, might be a CT angiogram uh, based on anatomy. The downside of that, however, is that many patients, while grateful for the diagnosis, don't relate that so much to the complaint, doc, I can't golf without getting chest pain or whatever. And so absence of the functional uh, stuff is still a bit of a, a problem with the CT scanning. But in terms of getting it uh, to a decision quickly, uh, there's a lot of evidence suggesting that that perhaps is the way to go. I might also add that uh, the ischemia trial is being uh, presented in a month or so, and I have the great opportunity to evaluate thousands of CT angiograms from around the world. These are patients with moderate to high uh, ischemic burden of whom we found 20% with no obstructive disease. So, you know, the CT angiogram is really uh, taking on uh, a, a huge uh, preference, if you will, uh, uh, early on in the evaluation of chest pain. Hey, Michelle. So some, uh, sorry, that's right. Um, so some other questions for the audience. So I think this one will be for Sabode. Um, so the thoughts about using um, EMPA as uh, monotherapy in diabetes uh, in patients with established but overall controlled diabetes, either on diet alone or on metformin. So people with with disease, ASCVD. They have. It, it's just a diabetic patient with an established but controlled diabetes, no overt. So, so no overt disease. Yeah, yeah so. I think she's, his diabetes and cardiovascular disease, you made a fairly provocative statement of starting off with an SGLT where traditionally we've been taught to start with metformin, yeah. well diet, exercise, metformin, and then if you have a cardiovascular disease to add an SGLT. You're, 
One of your slides was from the Europeans, which is an interesting concept because it would make it a lot easier for cardiologists because really we see a lot of these patients in our office or in CCU step down, not infrequently have diabetes or in there to have treatment for either heart failure or coronary disease. And maybe we should be taking ownership and starting these agents in the hospital. So there's actually two questions to that. One is SGLT first, and should we be taking more ownership in starting these patients and not sending it back to family doctors or referring? And there's a wrinkle in there, which is that I certainly, in my province, coverage for these drugs requires a certain stepwise approach. So I, I, I don't think I'll be able to address the last uh, question because that remains a, you know, that's an impediment for all of these strategies, including the costly ones that John mentioned. Uh, but I do think that the field is, is moving fast towards these agents being used earlier. Uh, once, you know, you've seen the Canadian guidelines for HEFREF, once there's an SGLT2 recommendation in people without diabetes on label to be used, uh, I hope that that will have a trickle effect to remind everybody that, oh, this patient doesn't have diabetes, I'm using an SGLT2 inhibitor in this patient for the treatment of HEFREF, and hopefully that'll reinforce what the Europeans have said, that what's the point of uh, Mr. Smith, who died at 56, with a good A1C from heart failure on a sulfonylurea, for example. You know, we have to be picking strategies in patients with diabetes that reduce cardiovascular events and have effects on A1C. So I totally support that, 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 that thesis. The, the question that the Europeans have said is that not just ASCVD, but they've broadened that to, to include people with diabetes who also have multiple risk factors and high risk risk factor. So I'm totally in support of that. I don't really think it's a fight with metformin. It's just a change in priorities, knowing that most patients with diabetes will probably need, need combination therapy, but, you know, uh, we now have data of superiority, and therefore that data of superiority should be respected and should be incorporated early. So I agree with you, Michelle, that I would definitely be, uh, you know, if I developed diabetes, that's exactly what I would do. Uh, but in patients who have diabetes with ASCVD, I do believe that, as the ACC has said, it is upon us. You know, you can do complex PCI and do LVADs and heart mm -hmm. failure and do bypass surgery and do heart transplant. I don't think it's that hard for cardiologists to learn how to prescribe yeah. GLP-1 and oh, SGLP-2. All right. So thank you, Svoboda. Just a couple quick questions here, John. All right, John. One minute. Sorry, uh, well, I just wanted to point out that metformin may become the digoxin uh, of, uh, of uh, diabetes care, but not quite yet. The reason to think about it that way, though, is that in these trials, although most patients were on metformin, some were not, and they reaped the same cardiovascular benefit, number one. Number two, the kinds of patients a cardiologist might deal with might be adequately managed with metformin for years. And the question is, should they be withheld, uh, kept yeah. away from superior medications with CVOT benefits? So I think the, the uh, Diabetes Canada and all of us are grappling with that right now. Okay, so just a few quick questions here. Uh, we've got about five minutes left. Uh, CRP, what's the role now? Is a risk enhancer in terms of primary, secondary prevention, any use of ordering that in terms of lipid lowering treatment, LDL target? Yes, yeah, CRP. Should we be ordering it? Um, it's, it's not uh, the most potent of risk enhancers, but it's still on the list. We can't ignore the Jupiter trial stopped for mortality benefit of statin in patients with so-called low LDL below 3.5 and high CRP. So it's still on the list. And if you come in with a, a second cardiac event, uh, a stent within a year to two years, and you're on 80 of Atorva, and your LDL is 1.7, your recommendations, should we be thinking of writing or at least discussing with the patient a PCSK9 and someone who comes in now, in other words, clearly got a, what we will call a reasonable target? Well, you know, 1.7 is, is kind of the borderline for the enrollment in these trials, and so 
you know, if uh, I think the answer could be, yeah, they, you should be doing something more. Yeah. Um, I would also suggest that you might want to understand the patient more. Uh, for example, is high LP small a elevated? And of course, are the other traditional risk factors appropriately managed? And what about the LDL that's 0.8? Do you get concerned and reduce the ATORVA or maximum dose Stanton? So LDL is 0 0.8. 0 0.8. Sleep well. Yes. So <laughs> ultra low LDL, really, there is no such thing anymore. It's safe. All right. So. And uh, there's a few questions on triglycerides. It's so remarkable, the reduction in cardiovascular morbidity, mortality, stroke. It's almost too good to be true. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, and how do we approach it? We don't have, it's called Vesepa in the United States. It's about $3,000. It's a pure, uh, this isopentethyl. Uh, so I guess you could cross the border and get it, but it's unlikely you'll be here in the near future. What's your thoughts on triglycerides, and what if you do have a triglyceride level of three or four millimoles? Uh, what about fibric acid? Are they dead in the water or? Uh, so first with regards to Vesepa, which is the, the intervention in the REDUCA trial, um, I tried to make the case that to me the more compelling mechanism of benefit is not triglyceride uh, lowering, but probably it's the first tissue and membrane antioxidant that's truly effective that we have. It remains to be seen. The, the triglyceride uh, uh, lowering effect is, is useful, but um, I tried to make the case that it might be a surrogate for what's happening with ApoB. The fibrates in um, uh, North America uh, really aren't uh, pushed that much, but they are still um, actually much more prominent in Australia, for example, and in other parts of the world. And I think that there are ongoing trials that may help um, uh, clarify and maybe even revive their role. But for now, other than pancreatitis and very high uh, triglycerides trying to avoid pancreatitis, uh, fibrates have a very limited role. Okay. I would just add yep. to that, uh, David, that the SEPA may be available in the first quarter uh, of, uh, of, of next year. Oh, and that in circulation about a week ago, there's a very elegant meta regression analysis of all trials. Uh, with and without pharmacotherapy, demonstrating a nice relationship between triglyceride lowering and cardiovascular events. So the triglyceride story, I think, is still on the table and remains unanswered, but that does not discount the fact that these agents may have triglyceride-independent effects. Okay, good. Well, our time is up. I'd like to thank my co-moderator, Dr. McGraham, and our two speakers. And I'd ask our next two speakers, Dr. Jeff Healy and Jason Andretti and Dr. Alan Skeins, to come up to, uh, to the podium here to the table, please. Okay, so Jeff, how are you doing?